Well, we're going to press on with our series on financial freedom. Where do I find it? Where can I find it? And we shift gears a little bit into the Old Testament. We're in Proverbs, and uh, the Proverbs are great. We all love the, the, the wisdom, the little sayings that we can capture out of Proverbs. It's one of the few books in the Bible where you can just read a couple of lines and it's self-contained. You don't have to get stressed out about context or taking things out of context or proof texting. So I, I like Proverbs. And uh, my fifth grade Sunday school teacher told us that there are 31 Proverbs and 31 days in the month. So we spent a year reading one proverb, one chapter a day as, as a class. It was a lot of fun. And uh, that was 12 months of doing that. So I, I got to where I really liked them. But we have other Proverbs in our world that might not be in the Bible, but might sound biblical. And so I'm going to share some of those with you. Some I have heard uh, just recently. Uh, most of these came from Wednesday night, our, our two Bible studies where we studied these texts. <clears throat> if wishes were horses, beggars would fly. It's a Miss Ann Looney Cook, she laid that one out. Better to keep one's mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. I'm going to put that on my wall myself. Here's a good one. A deaf husband and a blind wife are always a happy couple. <laughs> and from Mark Twain, few things are harder to put up with than a good example. <laughs> Learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. Man's work is from sun to sun. Woman's work is never done. Oh, some amens came out. <laughs> You'll like this one too. Whatever women must do, they must do twice as well as men to be thought half as good. Thankfully, thankfully, this is not hard. Ah. Uh, just think about that a little bit. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. It, this one is, this one's getting closer. Middle age, middle age is when the broadness of mind and the narrowness of the waist change places. <laughs> Before you criticize someone else, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, if he gets angry, you'll be a mile away, and, and he'll be barefoot. <laughs> Pretty good. The best part about living is in a small town is that when I don't know what I'm doing, somebody else does. And then this is the best. Life is like a little bird. It is absolutely beautiful until it poops on your head. <laughs> there it is. There you have some proverbs from modern day time. Let's pray together. <laughs> Lord, we thank you so much for laughter and for love and for wisdom that comes to us sometimes even in the funny, but always from you. We pray that you would send a a fresh move of your Holy Spirit in our midst as we open your word and seek to hear from you on this day. You uh, are so faithful. We love you, we trust you, and we thank you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, and we say together, Amen. Chapter, uh, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, and I may have a couple of verses that are not on the screen. I've, I've just been enjoying picking and choosing a little bit this week. So uh, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A child who gathers in summer is prudent, but a child who sleeps in harvest brings shame. And then from chapter 13, verse 18. Poverty and disgrace are for the one who ignores instruction but the one who heeds reproof is honored. And I'll read a little more, verses 22 through 25. The good leave an inheritance to their children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. 
The field of the poor may yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Those who spare the rod hate their children, but those who love them are diligent to discipline them. The righteous have enough to satisfy their appetite, but the belly of the wicked is empty. And then my favorite, chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, look at the ant, you lazy bones. Consider its ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, it prepares its food in summer and gathers its sustenance in harvest. And then this is a part I used to quote to my little brother when he was a teenager and slept a lot. How long will you lie there, O lazy bones? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed warrior. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we hear these very ancient words of wisdom this morning, you might be remembering other words of Scripture that we've heard the last few weeks. Other words like, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be handed to you. Or, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. Or, You cannot serve God and wealth. And there's a tension. There's a tension between what we've been hearing and what we hear today, isn't there? Maybe a little disconnect. It's, it's that same tension, I think, that we feel when we, when we try to live and think through saving and investing for the future. It all comes down to how much do I, how much do I need Versus how much do I want, right? Needing and wanting are two different things. It comes down to how, how do I tell the difference between a need and a want. For example, I think uh, I've been thinking a lot lately. We're going to have this little one. Do, do I save up for our little one to go to Tennessee Tech or to Harvard? There is a difference in price and not much difference in quality of education. I'll just tell you. I'm going to go for Tennessee Tech. Another question, is it better? Is it better to retire with a million dollars in the bank? Or will I need five or six million dollars in order to be comfortable? What does comfortable look like for us? Or maybe the question is, how much longer do I have to work in order to be able to retire without losing my house and having to eat dog food? Or how much can I help my grown children before I put my own retirement in jeopardy? Or here's another good one. Should we buy, should we buy the 3,000 square foot house to raise our one child and dog in? Or do I really need the 4,000 square foot house so we have plenty of room? And then I think about that little old lady that raised 12 children in an 800 square foot house with no running water. How did she ever do it? How did she do it? And then I wonder, if I buy this used car that I want, a used car that has 400 horsepower and camel leather seats, if I buy that used car for myself, what does that mean for my ability to be faithful to God's call on my life, to love and serve my neighbors? When I anticipate spending $500 a month on maintenance and $200 a month on fuel and $100 a month on insurance plus an unspecified amount for fast driving awards that are sure to come my way. (laughs) Suddenly, my $6,000 used car has become a $10,000 a year proposition. What does that mean for my ability to be faithful and to love and serve those around me? Do I live like a king? Do I live like a king because I can and still have enough left over? Or do I, do I live like a monk, wearing only old clothes and spending no more than what is absolutely necessary? Or should I seek some middle road of modesty that allows for reasonableness in spending 
and lavishness, lavishness and generosity instead of lavishness in spending and reasonableness in generosity. Need, want, planning for the future, faithfulness. Where is the balance in all of that? How do you find that balance? As, as Christians, I think it's right to say that we're all trying to find that balance, trying to balance those financial pieces of life that are such a real part of our lives. And, and I believe that wholeness comes when we find that balance. There are uh, some pictures. Go to the next one there. This is what I showed or talked to our Wednesday night class about. This is what was in my mind about balance. Finding the balance between squandering and hoarding. And the Wednesday night class did not like that. They said that is not an adequate description. And so they helped me come up with a better picture. Let's go to the next one. This is what finding balance looks like. <laughs> it's like a table balanced on a little point and we're trying to balance all of those things on this table of risk and make it all work out and it's constantly changing and the wind is blowing it's going to blow it over it and this is what balance looks like right it's very very difficult and a delicate balance it's hard work and it is individual family level work that each of us has to do as much as I would like I can't tell you what to do, and you can't tell me what to do. All we can do is encourage each other around biblical principles that we pull together from the whole witness of Scripture. And one of the places that, uh, where I find those principles is, is really from good old John Wesley, uh, one of the founders of Methodism. He preached an incredible sermon on the use of money. I think it's sermon number 50, if you ever want to Google it and read it. You have to translate from 1700s English to 2016 English, but it's, it's worth doing. He taught a lot about money because he found himself always caught between these two extremes. On the one hand, he was working with the wealthiest folks in England who were wrapped up in their own comfort. And on the other hand, he found himself right in the midst of the poorest of the poor who were tr just trying to make it. People who were working so hard to just not die of hunger. He was caught in between that. And he laid out these three principles that were meant to be taken together. He said, he said a person ought to earn all you can. Let's go to the next one. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. That's how he boiled it down for folks to understand. The first, earn all you can, it comes right out of Proverbs. It sounds like what we just read today, doesn't it? He meant work hard, be productive. Don't waste time, don't be lazy, be smart in your earning. Get better and better at what you do so that your work produces more and more. He said figure out as many ways to generate income as you can, but never at the expense of your health, your soul, or your family that was his wisdom and that means different things to different people but it means something doesn't it the second is save all you can that's right out of proverbs 2 we just read that as well don't squander money he said on on frivolous expenses like keeping up with the joneses or buying ostentatious clothes or carriages i guess for me it's a car not a carriage <laughs> or anything else like that. Don't eat so much expensive food. He said, don't drink so much expensive wine. Instead, lay plenty aside for the future. Anticipate, plan, think, prepare, look ahead, but don't store up so much wealth so as to endanger your children who might become enslaved to it at some point in the future. Then he went to the third principle, give all you can. And that comes straight from Jesus. It is that New Testament model of giving that makes us all nervous. It goes far beyond the tithe, the 10%. It's this idea that we're called to give whatever extra we have to the work of God in the world. Whatever we don't need. But in order to do that, to give all we can, we have to have that conversation. Well, what is 
what is the excess in my life? Is it based on my needs or on my wants? And what does that look like? Wesley, by his, uh, by his biblical teaching, he really created the middle class in England. They didn't have a middle class before this revival sparked. And after, after it had been going for 20, 30, 40 years, things had started to change in England. The whole culture was changed as, as folks were lifted out of poverty by hard work, by good planning, by education, and especially by a strong desire to do better so that they could help others do better. But now, now in this incredible transformation of a society, there lay the seeds of a cancer. And uh, John Wesley watched as, as Methodists became wealthy and very influential folks in their communities. As it happened, they began to forget the third caveat, which is give all you can. Their lives spun out of balance towards self-interest, toward protecting their wealth, and toward the desire for more. You see, even among the Methodists, greed reared its ugly head all over again. And that was the root of Wesley's greatest fear. He said it like this. He said, I'm afraid that the people called Methodists would become a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. Why would that happen? I think it happens because God's work lies in building people up so that we can spread the abundance of God's kingdom. Anytime that stops or anytime that breaks down, we step away from the power of God at work in the world. When we attend more to our own wealth and our own comfort than to the needs of those around us, we should step back and ask the question, are we slipping away from the power of God at work in the world? Have you ever noticed that, uh, that as our wealth increases, our distance from poverty also increases? You know, we, we live in ever nicer homes and ever nicer neighborhoods or maybe it starts when we move from a really really bad apartment to a less bad apartment that's still covered by section 8 housing funds maybe it starts like that and just goes from there you know the hobbies we have get more expensive and we uh we stop shopping at the dollar tree and we start going to the mall with the mall people we might even wind up at Turkey Creek, at Turkey Creek Mall, or that thing at Mount Juliet that's so crazy. We might we wind up there. You don't see any poor people shopping there, do you? No, no. There's no reason for them to go there. And so we wonder, should, should, should we feel guilty for living in a nice neighborhood or a nice home? No, you shouldn't feel guilty. Just don't neglect the poor among you. Just don't hide from the folks who are in need because that's where we encounter the true power of God. People say, well, I say it too. <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? Should I then stop planning and saving and thinking about the future? Should I stop trying to work to increase my own wealth? Is it somehow wicked or, or evil to feel a sense of God's blessing when we do well financially? Is that bad? Should I be covered in guilt all the time, go around apologizing to everybody when we, when we run it? No, it's not a conversation about guilt. It is a conversation about meaning and wholeness in life and especially about balance when it comes to all of life, even our finances. Wesley said, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And that helps us think about this balance. But there are three other principles that Wesley took from Jesus that help, I think, even more. And they're often called the three simple rules. Let's go to that next slide. He said, do good, do no harm, 
and stay in love with God. For Wesley, that captures the whole of the Christian faith. Do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. And these three move us from that linear thinking just about money, and they force us to ask the deep questions about our faithfulness to Jesus in every part of life. Now, when we put those together with the others, go to the next slide. That balance begins to look something like this. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God, earn all you can, give all you can, and save all you can. And there is, there is that peace, that place of wholeness in life in which all of these pieces are in their proper balance and in their proper perspective as the Holy Spirit leads each one of us. And I just wonder, what would it look like if you took this to your investment advisor, to your retirement planner, and said, I want to do this. What would they say? How would they respond? What would it be if we, uh, if we measured our investment success not just by rate of return, but also by faithfulness to God's call on our lives? No question that looks different for each one of us. But it looks, <laughs> and you have to look for it to see where you are, to see if you're going to find it. In that place of balance, I think, is God's blessing on you. But it's not just for you. It is a blessing for the sake of God's mission of loving the world back to life. And so I wonder, where are you today? Where am I today? Where would we like to be? By God's grace, let's get there together. Because there, we find life and freedom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen.